Do you think there is a crisis in the world and could the advertising world solve it? First of all, if there is a crisis in the world, the job is to define it. Um, the second thing I think, which is where I am optimistic, uh, where, the reason I'm optimistic for the world in a sense, is that really, in a way, progress happens not so much by the generation of new ideas, but by the abandonment of old assumptions. Um, and a few of the things we're beginning to understand now are, for example, complexity in general. Now, if you look at a complex system, which is closer to, say, a meteorological system uh, than it is to a simple mechanical system like a clockwork mechanism such as a watch, it's more complicated to model, emphatically. It's far more difficult to change. You, know, you can't use simple Newtonian physics in meteorology, nor can you use it in economies or in psychology, for example. You know, it simply isn't that simple. That's the bad news, that actually working out how to fix it is harder. The one piece of good news is that sometimes fairly large problems can be solved by fairly small interventions. Butterfly theory, if you like. And that's the one area where I'm, I'm optimistic. If we start to understand that complex systems are, are difficult and different from simple systems, and that treating economies as if they're like some sort of mechanism involving a couple of cogs and a lever is fundamentally fallacious. Once we start to realise that, then first of all, we'll stop this business of always trying to have big effects by creating wholesale change. There may be very, very small interventions, very small ideas that can have absolutely massive effects. Here in Holland, there's a very interesting case, uh, which I always regard as just a small example of that, where the typical mechanistic view of the world says if you want people to slow down when they're driving down a particular stretch of road, you place a speed camera there. And that's the kind of logical Newtonian incentives, disincentives, economic model for how you change behaviour. Um, to some extent, it doesn't work all that well, for reasons I won't go into now. What they found somewhere in Holland was with a, an apparently illogical intervention, simply removing the lines painted on the road, causes people to slow down instinctively without even being aware that they're doing it. So Buckminster Fuller talked about this idea of trim tab, which is the point on a ship or a plane where the smallest movement creates the biggest change. And actually on his gravestone it says, call me trim tab. That showed an early understanding, I think, of complexity. This kind of understanding that two things. One, it's not easy, it's not simple and predictable and me mechanistic. Therefore, we should stop trying to change the world through grand, necessarily through grand interventions that um, uh, cause considerable disruption. And we should spend time looking for, and incidentally failing in the search for, smaller interventions which may achieve greater things at, uh, with far fewer unintended consequences. So that, that's where I'm optimistic. First of all, we need to accept that actually this is an imperfect science and actually experimentation and failure uh, and modification and so forth are as much a part of the process as having a grand vision. Uh, the second thing is to understand that actually it isn't necessary to um, seek to change the world in order to change it. I'm sure there are people now dead, some people now alive, who have significantly changed the world, and yet we don't even know their names. And that assumption that in order to change the world you have to stage a revolution or achieve massive political power or some you know, enormous sort of upheaval in the way things are ordered and, and organised may be one of the great misconceptions we're starting to abandon, that trim-tab interventions, as Bucky would have called them, are actually much, much more interesting. In order to make those succeed, first of all, politics has got to understand that, first of all, its own sense of self-aggrandisement often requires it to do massive, high-profile, high-budget interventions. These may not actually be the best use of politicians' time. And the second thing politicians have got to do is uh, learn to get less embarrassed about failure and say, we tried this small thing, it didn't succeed very well, the ill effects were relatively trivial, relax about it. If you look at the business world, it really does work through, at its best, Silicon Valley as one example, through stochastic tinkering and experimentation. That's not my phrase, it's uh, Nassim Taleb's, I think. Stochastic tinkering is how it works. And one of the great things about the business world is that when a new idea comes along, 
entrepreneurs will try and implement that idea and indeed market that idea in six very different ways. And maybe only one of them succeeds. That, to some extent, is why capitalism works, because actually the rewards for trying something different in capitalism are quite high. If everybody else is wrong and you're right, the rewards, if you put money in the game for being proven right, are really pretty high. You might argue that cultures like politics, cultures like the public sector and academia, there's much more reputational risk involved. And actually the price of dissent is very high and the potential reward is very, very small. So the great thing about, the great thing about business is if you actually just, it, it, there is this extraordinary reward for actually looking at the world differently. You may fail quite a bit, but when you succeed, it really does pay off and relatively rapidly. I think, you know, there is quite a lot that academia and politics can learn mm. from how free markets actually work. I don't mean the deluded sort of neoclassical view of the, the, uh, uh, of the perfectly efficient market. I mean the kind of Schumpeterian view of, uh, you know, creative destruction and uh, entrepreneurial activity. The fact that actually, you know, this isn't actually, a, you know, an unstable thing in in constant disequilibrium, which is forever just searching for relative advantage over a competing company or a competing idea. And, that, uh, and to translate that, not that boring bit about the perfectly efficient market, what they've done in trying to introduce markets into, say, the public sector is actually to introduce some of the less attractive and less useful aspects of the public sector into these businesses. But if you can actually understand that there's a kind of dynamic competitive market for, for um, ideas, approaches, and indeed for marketing approaches. And here's my most radical suggestion, which will seem to you very weird. If you believe that value is subjective, there's no reason why the next big revolution couldn't be psychological, not technological. If we simply better understood what people valued, how they behaved, and what made people happy, that could actually raise the, the uh, quality of human life just as significantly, I, I would argue far more significantly, than some new widget or battery-powered device. They may be slightly interconnected. Um, that's the first point. And so you know, far more intelligent effort needs to go into understanding what you might call intangible value, not just how to make material stuff. After all, we're materially quite well off in the developed world already. You know, our appetite for stuff isn't infinite. Apart from anything else, you run out of storage space. Um, so understanding the value of intangibles and services and so forth, I think, you know, I think could lead to some really important innovation. And I think that's a dangerous thing about innovation, that it tends to be conflated with a particular kind of technological progress, whereas actually innovation takes place in all manner of different places, in distribution, but also in marketing. If you can work out new ways of uh, understanding consumer needs in a way that's much closer to the grain of human nature, then business efficiency can significantly improve without necessarily needing to change all that much what it actually makes or supplies. Does that sound too weird? I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people look at this and go, it's dangerously close to either propaganda or to kind of brave new world where we're drugged into being content with our own circumstances. I'm just saying there's an awful lot of wasted effort. The other, the final question is how many technological problems are really marketing problems or psychological problems in disguise? So I'm, I'm, I'm quite a keen fan of nicotine, um, not a fashionable point of view, I accept. The terrible thing with nicotine was the delivery device. And the electronic cigarette seems to me a very important invention. It's quite a lot of the pleasure of smoking, but with perhaps you know, a small percentage of the risk. The problem isn't the technology, that's already there and existing. The problem is a whole load of social pressures and frames around the fact that it's just embarrassing to smoke electronic cigarettes in public. The driverless car, Google's more or less perfected that. The problem with the driverless car is no longer technological in principle. It's legislative. How do we legislate for this, for blame in terms of software that goes slightly wrong and causes the, you know, a minor accident? Equally, it's also psychological. How do you design cars in such a way that gradually gets people to accept that you can be walking down a pavement and a device with no human in it passes you at 30 miles an hour? And that's the real challenge of the driverless car. It isn't the technology anymore.